Hey everyone, it's been two minutes and I haven't been raped yet. So let's investigate other things that feminists lie about. Hi, I'm Diana Davison, and I'm taking you on a journey through the transcripts of the trial of Gian Gameshi, who was cleared of sexual assault charges when his accusers were all shown to have lied under oath. One of the things I do, and everyone should do, when they hear allegations of sexual assault, is to try to place the story being told into perspective using a reality lens. By this I mean, does their story mesh with the way real people act, speak, and are motivated? Questioning a woman's story when she claims to have been raped or assaulted is called, quote, whacking the witness, unquote, by feminist legal fuckery. This term, whacking the witness, actually describes effective techniques to expose lies in bullshit stories. In court, that bullshit may be coming from the witness or accuser, and the whacking is merely addressing the falsity of their claims in a manner that leaves no room for reasonable belief. Basically, it's a term that describes skillful defense. It describes doing what courts were originally designed to do, bring the facts to light. Last week, I talked about the evidence that police did no actual investigation before charging Mr. Gameshi with serious crimes, based on flimsy evidence. While the police didn't actually analyze the data they were collecting, Marie Hennen, Gian's lawyer, did her job. One of the reasons I'm covering this trial in so much depth is to explain to others who are facing false accusations what type of evidence is permissible in court for reasons of full answer and defense. Now this is really important. Anything your accuser says under oath and to the police can be rebutted in court. And that leads us to today's evidence. Was Gian smitten with Linda Redgrave, the first witness? Linda's name was previously under publication ban, but she successfully applied to have that ban lifted. That's how proud she is of her lies. And that's how confident she is that nothing will happen to her for having committed perjury. Just something to think about. So Marie Hennen directs Linda to recall statements she made to the police and to media that are part of her story, and then challenges those statements with evidence. It's that simple. Part of Linda's story, a big part of it, is that from the moment Gian met her, he was quote-unquote smitten with her. She uses that word over and over again. This now becomes an element that can be challenged. Linda also states that she was in, quote-unquote, the industry, by which she means the arts and entertainment industry, which creates famous people, famous people like Gian Gameshi. This is intended to put her social position on par with his. This becomes an element that can be challenged. The best part of the segment I'm covering today is that one of Linda's own references, a friend that she had at the time of these events, I'm going to say they're no longer friends, when interviewed by police gave conflicting accounts of who was smitten with whom. The police didn't think this contradiction was relevant, and this friend was not called to testify by either side, but Hennen is able to bring up those statements without putting the friend on the stand, so you can see how that was done shortly. But let's start with the claim that Linda was an active member of the industry and that Gian had pursued her in some way because he was smitten on first sight. When they first met, while Linda was working as a waitress at a catered event, Linda already knew who Gian Gameshi was, and he had no clue who she was. She made a point of telling him that they had a mutual friend, someone Gian had previously written lyrics with back in his Moxie Freebus days. That was a band that he was in prior to his work with CBC. So Gion, being the nice guy that he is, said something along the lines of, Oh cool, and gave her his business card. Through his lawyer's line of questioning, we can see what Gion's version of events is. So pay close attention. After establishing that Linda knew of Gion in advance, Hennen goes on to ask, That was your mutual friend that you had been referring to. Okay. Now I just want to understand a little bit about what was going on back in 2002 for you. And you had answered some questions for my friend 
about what your life was like and what you were doing work-wise. Am I right that when you met Mr. Gameshi in 2002, you were about 41 years old? I was. And Mr. Gameshi was about six years younger than you. I think, I think so. He never told me at that point how old he was. Hennan asks, and I take it you would agree with me, Ms. Redgrave, that you were a mature person, right? Are you talking about my age? Now, Hennan isn't mocking Linda for being older than Gian. She's not saying, for example, that women in their 40s can't be sexually assaulted. She's rightfully addressing Linda's narrative that Gian was smitten with her in a room full of celebrities. You were a person with life experiences. You had been married, right? Yes. And you had... You told the Crown you had two children, right? Yes. And you also told the Crown that you were involved in the industry, doing commercials, and also working as a waitress and modeling. Am I right? Redgrave says, I worked. I worked with photographers, and I worked as a makeup artist. I worked in the acting. I did as many part-time jobs as I could around my kids. Note here that she says, in the acting. This is not the way people in the industry describe their jobs. Ever. Hannon says, And just so I understand it, when you say you were separated at the time, am I right that you were, in fact, and you told the police this, you were living with your husband? We were living separately in our house before he moved out. Right. And we were considered legally separated. Hannon says, So you were considered legally separated? Redgrave says, When I asked a lawyer, she said, You're... You can consider that separated when you're living on different floors of your house. So part of Linda's statement to media and police is that she was separated from her husband at the time. She was traveling to see Gian perform on his show Play. It wouldn't look good for Linda if she was actually still in a marriage, sneaking away to try and catch herself another man. So let's see how that goes for her. Is Linda telling the truth about her relationship? Hennan asks. And so if you filed in your divorce application that you were legally separated in 2004. Is that incorrect? Yeah, my divorce. No, that you were legally separated, that you had two separations, one that was earlier and then you separated. Redgrave says, yeah, I had another. And then says, just let me finish my question. You were in fact separated on May 5th, 2004. Redgrave says, yeah, no, that, yes, 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 yes. Question, all right. Answer, I think. So, Linda claims she was legally separated at the end of 2002 when talking to police, but there are divorce papers that say she was legally separated in 2004, more than a year later. It takes a lot of work for Hennan to get the truth out of Linda, even when faced with legal paperwork that shows she wasn't legally separated when she met Gameshi. Keep in mind that if it's that hard to get the truth about a simple fact, it doesn't bode well for more complicated issues. Hennan asks, So let's go back to 2002 and 2003 so we can understand. You're living in the same house, but you're obviously in the throes of, yeah, a marriage separation breakdown, right? Yes. And you have two children. Yes. At the time, the teenager and an 11-year-old, is that right? Yes. And you said that you were working in the business at the time, I take it you would agree with me that you weren't doing particularly well, right? You weren't making a lot of money. Redgrave says, but my main focus was my children. Hennan says, I understand that. It wasn't to make a lot of money. Hennan, right. And so when you say that you were in the industry in response to, yeah, Mr. Callahan's questions, you weren't really actively in the industry, right? You had other priorities. You were a mom. Mm-hmm. And so you were doing this sort of on a part-time basis, right? Everything was, yeah. Hennan, I'm sorry? Redgrave says, everything was part-time. Hennan, right, so you weren't a full-time actress, you weren't a full-time model, you weren't a full-time anything. Answer, I just said I wasn't. Right. And when you met with Mr. Gameshi for the very first time, you met him when you were waitressing at the CBC party, am I right? Yes. I want to talk to you about that first meeting that you've described to not only the police, but to the media, all right? So you're a, what you call a cater waiter, is that right, for Urban Source in December of 2002? Yes. Now remember that reality lens I mentioned earlier? Let's run this story through that lens. 
All of this questioning is relevant because it addresses Linda's characterization of how they met, and whether or not Gian would have been awestruck by her presence. They met at a function where Gian is surrounded by attractive celebrities who are all guests with successful careers, and Linda is not one of those people. So you're not a guest at the party? No. And you recall describing your first interaction with Mr. Gameshi as smitten? He was smitten with you? Yes. And in fact, you tell the police that that's the word you use, right? The word I've used is smitten with me. Yes. Do you recall telling the police that? Yes, I do. And that's how you characterized your first interaction, that he was very attracted to you, right? Right. And you described to the police how you knew that, and you said he would say, hi, and come back with more hors d'oeuvres, and things like that, right? Yes, and more enthusiastically than that. Henan says, he was more enthusiastic than I am? Yes. Henan says, I see. And so he would say to you then, just to be fair, enthusiastically, come back with more hors d'oeuvres, right? Yes. So, come back with more hors d'oeuvres. Apparently, to Linda Redgrave, that is the sign of consent. Asking someone to do their job means they're obviously attracted to you. This is important because Linda is currently supporting a yes means yes campaign in which nothing can be presumed about whether or not a person is really that into you. Hennon says, And the second thing you tell police is that when you walk into the first play episode, you say to the police that when he saw me, his face lit up and it was like, you came, you came, right? Do you recall telling the police that? I recall telling the police that. Can you imagine a man telling police and the courts that he knew a woman wanted sex because she had a glint in her eye, and when she saw him, her face lit up? Apparently, women can read intentions into a man's mind by the way they perceive light refracting off his eyeballs. But this was a big part of Linda's story, that Gian Gameshi was instantly smitten with her, so much that he was actively pursuing her by asking her to do her job by giving her his business card and telling her about the show he was working on. Hennon says, and in fact, you didn't just tell the police that, you also told the media that, right? That story, I did. That he was smitten with you, right? I did. And you recall that when you were on the radio on As It Happens, and you were asked to describe what happened, you said, when you go to the show, he lit up. And he was like, he... Do you recall telling the media that? I recall telling the media that. And so do you agree with me that the story that you were telling both the police and the public was that Mr. Gameshi was very dazzled by you, right? Yes. And he was smitten, to use your words, right? I'd say smitten. I don't know about dazzled. I don't, I wouldn't say dazzled. Smitten, as in he was interested. And so much so that you noticed the minute you walked into the move and pick, his face lit up, right? Yes. Now, Move and Pick is the name of the venue they filmed the show play at. Keep in mind, Linda had a conversation with Gian because she approached him and told him that she was good friends with one of his friends, and that resulted in him giving her his business card. If your reality filter hasn't kicked in yet, here's what Linda's friend had to say about the true nature of their contact. And this is from the disclosure from the Toronto Police after they interviewed Linda's reference. So they know this. The Toronto Police pursued charges after hearing from Linda's friend. Marie Hennan asks, And so if I were to suggest to you that your friend, Ms. Ferrante, says that you were in fact the one who was smitten by him because he was a famous person and that you were taken aback by him, is that not consistent with what you recall telling her? Ms. Hennan I cannot speak for Maria Ferranti. I can tell you what I saw in my story. You'd have to ask Maria what she's saying. Hennon says, I'll ask you the question again. Do you recall telling Ms. Ferrante that you were smitten by Mr. Gameshi, that you were impressed because he was famous and that you were taken aback by him? I don't recall saying anything of that sort. That is incorrect. Hennon says, okay. And do you recall then, after this incident in the car where your hair is pulled, do you recall telling your friend, Ms. Ferranti, that you wanted to see him again, that you're very excited about seeing him again, and that you wouldn't stop talking about him? Do you recall that you kept talking to your friend about how excited you were about him? Redgrave says, I don't recall saying that at all to her. Hennon says, all right. 
So just so we have your answer under oath clearly, is your evidence that it's possible that you would have said to her that you were excited about seeing him and that you wanted to see him again? Or is your answer that it did not happen? You never said that. My answer, to be clear, is that what I said to Maria may have been changed on her end, but what I said were not those words. All right, so back to this question of so-called whacking. Who's whacking who? Certainly not Henan. Linda Redgrave gave her friend Maria's name to the Toronto police as someone who could verify her story. Maria, bless her, told the truth to the police, and her recollection of events is now whacking Linda in court. This is Linda's own reference given to support her credibility. Hennen only has this evidence because the Toronto police had it and had to turn it over to her. So, quick reminder here for the falsely accused. Your lawyer should share disclosure from your case with you and be very persistent to obtain full disclosure. Linda Redgrave's current enemy in court is not Marie Hennen or Gian Gameshi. She is now battling her own witness, her own reference, her probably former friend, the actual truth teller, Maria. Question. You said, Ms. Redgrave, that you were smitten with him and that you were excited about him and wanted to see him again and again. Redgrave says, I will not accept that I was smitten with him and wanted to see him again. I will accept that I really liked him, that I thought he was a really nice person, he was intelligent and charming and a gentleman. It was that one incident that I had had that I was unsure of if it was just him not knowing what he his own strength. Hennen says, are you not even prepared to admit that you wanted to see him again? I did want to see him again. And again, right? Well, I don't understand what you mean again and again. I can't predict when I'm meeting somebody and getting to know them how many times I want to see them. It takes time to know if you want to see someone. Hennen asks, would you accept that between the time you see him at the party at CBC and the time that the incident occurs in the house, in a span of two and a half weeks. You drive all the way from Woodbridge to Toronto to see him on three occasions while he's taping a show. Will you accept that fact? I did. But Linda hasn't been willing to admit to anything. Linda wants us to believe that she is traveling to see Gion through Ontario winter conditions because he was smitten with her, and not the reverse, going out of her way to catch and keep his attention. All of this based on a perceived glint in Gian's eye that gave her permission to pretty much stalk him and try to maneuver events to get alone with him. So remember, it's Linda's own friend who is whacking her testimony here. This isn't misconstruing emails hoarded away by some bizarre person. This evidence comes from a person that Linda told police to interview to corroborate her story. This is evidence coming from Linda's own friend. Now, it's kind of surprising that Kevin Donovan, Canada's supposed premier investigative journalist who was one of the main people breaking this story, didn't ask for such references or check them out before vouching for Linda's credibility. So back to the trial. The second time Linda drove through the wind and snow to get close to Gion, nothing significant happened. She told police that. She went. Nothing happened but she maintains that Gian would light up when she entered the room. This is what her friend Maria truthfully told Toronto police about that second so-called date. Hennen asks, All right, and I'm going to suggest to you that rather than it being a flirtatious interchange, and an interchange where there was chemistry, that in fact you were pretty upset after you attended that second play episode. Do you recall that? I disagree. And you know that the police interviewed your friend, Ms. Ferrante, right? I know that. All right, because you gave her name to them, right? Yes. All right, and I'm going to suggest to you that what you told your friend after attending that second play episode is that you were very disappointed because he really didn't look interested in you at all like the first time. Do you recall telling? I don't recall that, and I can't speak for Maria. You're going to have to let me finish my question because the court reporter is trying to take it down. All right, so my question was, do you recall telling Ms. Ferrante that you were disappointed? No, I don't. And do you recall telling her that he didn't seem interested in you at all? No, I don't. All right, and just so we're clear, and his honor has your answer, when you say you don't remember it, do you mean that you did not say that, or it's possible you said that, but you forgot today? 
Redgrave says, I'm saying that I have no recollection at all of saying something that I wasn't thinking to her, and I was not thinking of. Right, so that never happened. In other words, you would never have said those words. I never would have said those words. And so she then would never have said to you, quote, just leave it alone, just, he's probably changed his mind, don't bother. Redgrave says, she didn't say that to me that I remember. Hennen, she did not say that to you, all right. So Miss Ferrante's recollection of your feelings after that second play episode, which is that it wasn't any chemistry, that there was no flirtation, that does not accord with your recollection of that. No. Second again, you're going to have to wait till I finish. That doesn't accord with your recollection of that second interaction you have with him at play. Am I right? That's correct. But you agree that you don't go out with him that night, the second episode. I needed to go home. So agree with me that you do not go out with him. I do not go out with him. All right. And there was no urgency to attend the second play episode, right? No, there wasn't. That was something you wanted to do. Yes. All right. So there's a phrase from the 80s, bunny boiler, that comes from a film called Fatal Attraction, in which a woman, played by Glenn Close, becomes focused on a guy and kills the family pet rabbit, leaving it boiling in a pot on their stove. Linda Redgrave is acting like a bunny boiler. One of the things fact finders should focus on is motive and probabilities. So Linda was a part-time nobody with no real career and her marriage was on the rocks. She is unwilling to admit that she wasn't legally separated even when faced with her own divorce records and she's unwilling to admit that she was actively pursuing Gian Gameshi instead of the opposite, even when her own witness says that's the case. The police are unwilling to concern themselves with contradictions in Linda's story, even when her own reference tells them that Linda is mischaracterizing events. They just don't want to know about that. So Gian's version of events, as presented in court by his lawyer Marie Hennen, are that Linda approached Gian and told him of a mutual friend. Gian was not arrogant and egotistical, he was quite polite to Linda, gave her his business card and was friendly with the serving staff at a public event where an egotistical bad man would actually just try to end the conversation as quickly as possible. Can't be seen cavorting with the serving staff, right? An event where he was surrounded by other celebrities, who are mostly attractive, successful people. Linda would have us believe that he was distracted by her. That following their meeting, Linda, according to her own friend, became unreasonably focused on pursuing a connection with Gian, even after failing to get his attention at further meetings. Linda ignored advice from her good friend and continued to pursue Gian, working harder than Canada Post to deliver herself through rain or snow leaving her children to travel to Toronto and put herself in Gian's presence. Gian was just too nice to tell her to fuck off. Remember, Gian Gameshi's job was to be nice and to get people into his audience for the live taping of his show. Gian's job forced him to be nice to people, even if he didn't like them. Gian's job was to have a glint in his eye, even if he was actually thinking, I'd rather be at home right now. So who is the vulnerable one here? Linda got Gian Gameshi's business card while she was working as hired help at an event he attended because it was Gian's job to be nice to everyone, and he did that well. Instead of the vain, egotistical man the media asks us to believe he was, he took the time to be polite and receptive to a waitress who approached him and told him they had a mutual friend. He gave her his business card and invited her to attend his show, his public show. Somehow, this is not seen as Gian just doing his job. Somehow, we're supposed to think this is creepy. Linda, despite her current rhetoric about what consent looks like, tells us in court that Gian was sexually interested in her, and she knew this because of a glint in his eye and her perception that he lit up when she entered the room a room in which he was performing as the nicest man in Canada. You know, if you ask me, that was probably his biggest mistake. Linda didn't need Gian to express sexual interest in her verbally, according to her. She didn't need him to tell her directly that he was interested in dating her. 
according to Linda, but not according to her honest friend, it was obvious to her from his simple appearance. It was obvious because he had a glint in his eye, and he smiled at her. Anyone else seeing a double standard here? So, who's lying? Is it Linda, or is it Linda's friend and Gian Gameshi? Is anyone unclear what Gian's version of the story is yet? Next week, we'll find out why Linda probably did cry all the way home in the cab after she spent a short time in Gian Gameshi's house. And it's not because she was assaulted.